Regular meeting number 13 will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. This evening, Council is grateful to have our city's pastor, Pastor Mike Young, here to pray with us from City of Grace. Pastor, welcome back to Council. Thank you, Mr. President, Council members. We give honor to all elected officials in the House, and most importantly, to the people of the City of Columbus. We recognize that there are some important issues that we're here to talk about tonight. And, uh, you know, your job many times is about policies. But it's not really about policies, it's about people. And uh, I commend you as you deal with people's matters, and we're going to bathe it in prayer. So let us go before the throne. Father, as we come before your presence tonight, we give you thanks for who you are and what you do. You've been good, you've been kind, you've been gracious, and you've been loving to us. And Father, what we ask for tonight, God, is we ask for your presence to be in this room. Father, we pray for your presence, Lord God, and we pray for the peace that comes with it. Peace that the Bible said passes all understanding. Peace that has the ability to rule and comfort our hearts, even in the midst of storms. Father, we don't pray just for peace, but we pray for joy, joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, the type of joy that can minister to us even in the midst of sorrow. Now, Father, we lift before your presence, Lord God, our city council. We lift before your presence everyone that would speak tonight, Lord God, for we recognize that there are great matters that are weighty tonight. We recognize that there's great passion in this room. And, Father, what we pray is we pray, Lord God, that you'll rest, rule, and abide over this conversation. We pray, Lord God, that you'll give our council members wisdom, Father. For, Lord God, you said, Lord, that those who were in leadership, Lord God, that they needed prayer, Lord God. And we pray, Father God, as you, Lord God, lead God and direct this conversation, that you allow them, Father, to weigh out the matter, Lord God, and do that which is best for the city of Columbus and the people of Columbus. For, Father, our heart's desire for this great city is peace, is prosperity, Lord God. Father, we don't want just some to prosper, but we want every citizen in this city, Lord God, to prosper. So, Father, we pray, Lord God, that you'll reach, Lord God, to the highest mountain and you'll reach down even into the lowest valleys. And, Father God, that you'll begin to meet the needs of all. Father, we thank you, Lord God, in advance for what's going to take place tonight. And, Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Ockhauer, Dorans, Faber Green, Remy Weich, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to spend for the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Ockhauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Are there, we'll go around the dais for announcements or uh, resolutions by my colleagues, starting with Councilmember Bankston. Uh, thank you, President Harden. Um, again, as I've uh, reminded folks uh, that Accelerate Columbus, uh, our program for small and entrepreneur businesses, 
is still open. Uh, many programs are nearing capacity. Uh, so if you are interested, I encourage folks to apply uh, as soon as possible. Uh, you can look uh, on the city's website for a full list of the 10 organizations that are participating and also find more information and apply for the program on the Small Business Hub, which is cbussmallbizhub.com. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rosa de Abadia. Uh, thank you, Council President. I do have one resolution this evening. Uh, first, I want to say happy Women's History Month. And throughout the month, we will be celebrating, and there will be more to come. Uh, today, I would like to introduce Resolution 0049X 2024 to honor and recognize March 3rd through the 9th, 2024, as Women in Construction Week. Later this week, we'll be celebrating and honoring some of our community members. During this week, let's amplify the voices of women in construction, highlighting their achievements and advocating for greater diversity and inclusion within the field. These women are breaking down barriers and building paths forward. And with that, I move to adopt this resolution. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dale Coward, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you, and we're excited um, that we will be passing that resolution on and then also celebrating um, for the first time our Labor Council has two females that are leading uh, that effort, and we're very excited to honor their achievements. So look out for our social media channels for more on that. And that is all for me this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Dayalkar. Nothing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Press Pro Tim. Thank you, Council President. Uh, no uh, resolutions, but did want to acknowledge some guests we have with us here this evening. Uh, we have a number of uh, union members from Ask Me Local 1632, uh, one of our bargaining units of the city. Uh, if you guys want to stand. Um, thanks for being here tonight. They're here uh, with a solidarity event as they begin negotiations with the city uh, for a new collective bargaining agreement. And these are the folks that literally keep the city running on a daily basis. And um, you know, we need to continue, as we always talk about, the city being an employer of choice and making sure that we're doing everything possible to retain uh, a skilled workforce that, again, is making sure that our residents have the highest level of service across every spectrum uh, here in Columbus. So we certainly wish them well as they uh, sit down at the bar bargaining table with the Depart Department of Human Services, or uh, uh, Human Resources, and we certainly uh, know that the city and, and the union will be sitting down and negotiating good faith to get a contract that uh, provides the dignity and the respect that our, our workforce deserves, and this council looks forward to receiving that proposal uh, when those negotiations uh, come to a close. So thanks for being here tonight, and look forward to seeing that contract uh, uh, after the, all the parties sit down at the negotiating tables. So thanks for seeing you all. Do I have? Councilmember Favor. Councilmember Green. Councilmember Remy. Councilmember White. Uh, are there any announcements from our elected officials? Uh, good to see you, Madam Hill, uh, uh, Auditor. I apologize. Um, I, well, I, I also want to echo Councilmember Brosa de Padilla's uh, celebration of uh, Women's History Month and also. Uh, because we have a social worker now on City Council, uh, happy Social Worker Appreciation Month as well. Um, as a reminder, there will be no council meeting on Monday, March 11th, so the next regular meeting of council will be Monday, March 18th. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a vibrant discussion here at council about the city's historic pattern of car-centric development and the need to be better uh, to protect our bicy bicyclists and pedestrians. And I think this council would be remiss not to acknowledge that another pedestrian was killed by a driver this weekend and that another cyclist has been hospitalized following a hit and run on Morris Road. And so I know my colleagues uh, and I, specifically Councilman Barossa de Padilla is working with the city's department on discussion and next steps. And I appreciate her leadership. Um, and then Lastly, I, I know that many residents are joining us today um, to continue our conversation around Israel and Palestine. We have a short meeting today, um, but there are a few pieces of legislation that we must pass, including the city's $1.2 billion budget. Uh, once we get through that agenda, we will dedicate the remainder of this time to this uh, conversation. So, um, so the community can see the, the peaceful organizing and hear the passion that I have witnessed in the last five months we will leave the cameras on uh, for CTV to capture this part of the official record during our agenda. Um, so just wanted to allow folks um, in the audience to, to know that. Um, are there any 
uh, members of council, are, are there any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution for tonight's agenda? Hearing none, may we now have a motion to waive uh, readings of titles of 30-day legislation by the clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. Bingston, Barosa de Padilla, de all Cower, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30 legislation on tonight's agenda? Public Service and Transportation Committee, Resolution 33X-2024, Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, Ordinances 380, 483, 501, 513, 535, and 537-24. Thank you, Madam Clerk. There are no speakers on the first reading portion of the agenda. The following numbers... Uh, the following uh, ordinance appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those into the record? Resolutions of expression 45X, 47X, 48X, 50X-2024. Finance and Governance Committee Ordinances 373, 426, 428, 438, 461, 482, 508. 2024 Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 403, 449, and 549-2024 Neighborhoods, Recreation, and Parks Committee Ordinance 507-2024 Housing, Homelessness, and Building Committee Ordinances 361, 531, 532, 533, 536, 552, 553 2023-2024 Health and Human Services and Equity Committee, Ordinance 342-2024. Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee, Ordinances 307, 312, 528, 576, and 667-2024. Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, Ordinances 217, 232, 253, 295-297-305-322-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-323-
three full bathrooms in a two-car garage of 1638. We cannot find any homes like this was built over 100 years ago. And here we are, habitats coming in here, building these cookie-cutter homes that we don't want. We want some rehabbing houses done. Now, like I said to you, the way to put down these guns with young folks, paying them $38 an hour to rehab and, and bring in some trade back in this community. That's what we all need to do now before we do anything else with Habitat Humanity. Because what I see now is Habitat is buying up everything now. It's not giving an annual opportunity for residents or contractors to train some of these young people to bring job skills and training so we can put this life of crime down. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, for your, your advocacy. I think that um, uh, your consideration for working with um, Habitat to make sure that the homes that they are building in um, your neighborhood and all of our neighborhoods um, support families, but also fit into the community in which um, they're building is well, well taken, ma'am. Um, are there any questions or comments on the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. de I'm sorry, Alcauer. <laughs> Yes, with the exception of 0342-2024, on which I am abstaining. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Ms. Green. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. Mr. White. Yes. President Harden. Yep, consent uh, portion of the agenda is passed. Uh, we will now uh, proceed to, uh, we'll now proceed with uh, second reading of 30-day table and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance and Governance Committee, chaired by Councilmember Banks. And Councilmember, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Council President. Tonight in the Finance and Governance Committee, uh, for second reading, we have Ordinance 3011-2023 to make appropriations for the 12 months ending December 31st, 2024, for each of the several object classes for which the City of Columbus has to provide from the monies known to be in the Treasury of said City of Columbus in the fund known as the General Fund, during the said 12 months from the collection of all taxes and from other sources of revenue, the amount of $1,211,579,657 and to declare an emergency. Uh, as I mentioned last week, this ordinance along with the following two ordinances, 3012-2023 and 30. 13-2023 represent the city's annual operating budget and contains appropriation requests and amendments that council has worked with the administration and outside organizations to finalize. This ordinance specifically establishes the general fund budget appropriations for departments, commissions, and offices of the city of Columbus for fiscal year 2024. The following ordinance, uh, 3012-2023, establishes the budget appropriations for divisions and departments of the City of Columbus for fiscal year 2024 for funds other than the general fund, such as internal services, the enterprise funds, and special revenue funds. And lastly, the third operating budget ordinance, 3013-2023, establishes the budget appropriations for divisions and departments of the City of Columbus for fiscal year 2024 for selected funds other than the general fund, or operating funds, such as debt services funds, tax incentive funds, and the hotel motel tax fund. Um, I want to, again, pause and thank uh, Council President and his team for his support throughout uh, this budget process uh, as I take on the role as finance chair. I also want to thank my council colleagues for their innovation and collaboration uh, and for the uh, amendments that were put forward that I believe reflect this council's priorities, but also reflect equity uh, in our work as a city. Uh, also want to thank Director Matt Erickson and his team in the Legislative Research Office uh, for their work, as well as the mayor for putting forward a strong budget, and also all of our department uh, leaders here uh, and aides and assistants and all of the council work, um, all those working behind the scenes uh, for council as well. Uh, to ensure that this budget uh, we are voting on tonight invests in the needs of this community and also bolsters our city's strengths. 
Uh, I'll pause there. Are, are there any questions or comments for my colleagues before I move for passage? Seeing none, um, I move for passage as amended. I just want to thank you, uh, Chair Bankston, for the leadership that you showed this year. Um, this is a historic budget, $1.2 billion. And to your point, it both uh, brings together the administration's priorities that represent a growing, thriving city, as well as the priorities of this council as we address the needs of our community as we continue to grow. Um, so I, too, wanted to uh, thank you, thank Auditor Kilgore, thank the, the staff. Uh, the, di the directors, um, everyone who played a role in this. Also, shout out to the folks who came out to five very long public hearings um, that council held over the last six weeks. Uh, we are appreciative, and hopefully the advocacy that uh, was shown during those hearings um, will see themselves in this budget. Um, so uh, without further ado, clerk, please call the roll. Ready? Bankston, Barossa De Padilla, Dayoff Cower, Dorans, Favor Green, Remy White, President Harden. Passed. Uh, thank you, uh, Council President. The next um, ordinance, again, uh, the next two ordinances are the operating budget. Uh, the next ordinance is 3012 2023 to make appropriations and transfers for the 12 months ending December 31, 2024 for other funds for various divisions to authorize the city auditor to make transfers as may be necessary and to declare an emergency. Uh, seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, uh, I move for passage as amended. Second. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Aucauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Uh, thank you. Next, we have ordinance 3013-2023 to make appropriations for the 12 months ending December 31, 2024 for selected other funds for various divisions to authorize the auditor to make transfers as may be necessary and to declare an emergency. Uh, seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, I uh, move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Cower, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Uh, next in Finance and Governance Committee, we have Ordinance 0424-2024 to authorize the director of the Department of Technology on behalf of various city departments to renew a contract with Converge One Inc. for maintenance and support services associated with the city's interactive voice response system to waive the competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Codes and to authorize the expenditure of $202,402.54 from the Department of Technology Information Services uh, Operating Fund. As mentioned in the title, Converge One Inc is an IT service management company that provides maintenance and support services for our Genesis Interactive Voice Response System. Various cities' agencies use the current IVR system, including 311, public utilities, building and zoning services, and technology department. Passage of the ordinance will allow the Department of Technology to renew a contract with Converge One, which will be the fourth renewal based on the five-year quote provided by Genesis. The cost to, re, uh, to renew the contract for these services totals $192,402.54 and is for a one-year period beginning on April 30th, 2024 and ending on April 29th, 2025. Contingency funds in the amount of $10,000 are included in the total cost uh, of $202,402.54 and a waiver of competitive bidding is being requested since this is a year, uh, this is a five year contract and this is year four of that. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Aucauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 0427-2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Technology to enter into contracts with Vertive Corporation for annual maintenance and related services associated with the uninterrupted power supply systems in accordance with sole source provisions of Columbus City Code to waive competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Code to authorize the director of the Department of Technology to enter into contract with Vertive Corporation for heating 
cooling and ventilation systems and various equipment maintenance and to authorize the expenditure of $236,344.75 from the Department of Technology Information Services Division Information Services Operating Fund. Vertive Corporation is a multinational provider of critical infrastructure and services for data centers and related facilities. Passage of this ordinance will allow the Department of Technology to contract with Vertive Corporation, uh, the only factory authorized service provider to provide maintenance for the city's uninter uninterrupted power supply systems. Passage of the ordinance will allow the Department of Technology to co contract with Vertive for HVAC maintenance and support as well. And this ordinance is also requesting a waiver of competitive bidding. Having one vendor for the expertise to manage our uninterrupted power supplies and the HVAC systems that go along with it under one umbrella contract will prevent the reoccurrence of various systems malfunctioning at the main city data center. Uh, in the past, there were five separate vendors which caused inefficiencies in routine support and maintenance. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. May I move to the Economic Development and Small Minority Business Committee? Please. Thank you. Tonight in the Economic Development and Small Minority Business Committee, we have Ordinance 0481-2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a dual-rate jobs growth incentive agreement with Quality Logistics, LLC, doing business as long ship logistics for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed total capital investment of $200,000 and the creation of 50 net new full-time permanent positions with an annual estimated payroll of approximately $3,570,000. Quality Logistics is a third-party logistics company specializing in over-the-road truckloads of fresh, frozen, and dry shipments that meet the customized needs of their clients. They are proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $200,000 in leasehold improvements to establish logistics, administrative sales, and IT operations in Ohio. With the investment, uh, the company proposes to enter into a lease agreement on a vacant commercial office space consisting of approximately 6,500 square feet at 4449 Easton Way, Suite 100 uh, in Columbus. Quality Logistics is requesting a dual rate jobs growth incentive for the city of Columbus to assist with establishing logistics, administrative sales, and IT operations in Columbus. The Department of Development has recommended a dual rate jobs growth incentive in an amount equal to 25% of the city's in Columbus income tax withheld on Columbus payroll of new employees and 30% of the city of Columbus tax withheld on Columbus payroll of new employees who are also Columbus City residents. Uh, and this is something that we have been doing of a way to ensure and incentivize companies to not only uh, bring jobs to our city, but to also hire our residents uh, as well. Uh, this will be for a term of five consecutive years. Uh, the total cumulative new payroll over the term of the job growth incentive uh, to Columbus will be approximately $3.57 million and all of the jobs are well over the $20 an hour threshold. Uh, last year, I do want to point out that this council passed incentive deals to improve our region's cold storage capacity and competitiveness. And this ordinance tonight is a direct benefit of that economic development strategy uh, and shows how intentional investments can lead to our cities uh, attracting new businesses, but also remaining competitive in this growing um, um, sector. Uh, without our investment in cold storage, we may not have been able to even uh, attract quality logistics LLC. Uh, our friends at the Department of Development tell us that it was a competitive process uh, and that they looked at many locations around the United States and landed on Columbus because of, I believe, the strong mix in our economy as well as our new investments in cold storage. Um, our uh, um, assistant director, deputy director, is with us tonight. Is there anything that you want to add to that? Uh, no, Councilmember Banks, and the only thing I would add is this really is the result of leveraging that investment um, in the cold storage to make sure that companies like this continue to be uh, attracted to, to the city of Columbus and continue to bring jobs and um, good opportunities to our residents. Uh, thank you, Madam Director. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. 
Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, <coughs> Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, Council President. So I'll have in my committees this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee to come before Council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee, chaired by Councilman Barosa de Padilla. Councilman, the floor is yours. Sorry. User error. I have one ordinance today in public service and transportation. That's ordinance 0494-2024 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fees, simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the operation safe walk school sidewalks refugee road sidewalk project and to authorize an expenditure of $7,566. The project will create new and upgraded pedestrian facilities along refugee road between Winchester Pike and Hamilton Road, connecting with inf infrastructure improvements planned for Hamilton Road between Interstate 70 and Refugee Road. The finished project will enable pedestrians and bicyclists to reach retail, church, post office, and other establishments without traveling in the street or the berm. The city must acquire certain fees, simple title, and lesser real estate located in the vicinity of Refugee Road from No Bixby Road to Moon, Blue Moon Drive in order for DPS to timely complete the public project. The city's acquisition of the real estate will help make, improve, or repair certain portions of the public right-of-way located in the vicinity of Refugee Road from No Bixby to Blue Moon Drive which will be open to the public without charge. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. That's all for my committees this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come before Council is the Workforce, Education, and Labor Committee, chaired by President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Tonight we have Ordinance 0012 2024 to authorize the City Attorney on behalf of the Department of Human Resources to enter in a contract with the law firm Baker Hostiller LLP for the provision of legal services to authorize the expenditure of $50,000 in the Employee Benefits Fund to waive competitive bidding requirements to call the codes and declare an emergency. Uh, Baker and Hostler LLP has been selected to provide assistance because of its experience representing the City of Columbus in previous labor negotiations with all of our bargaining unions. Uh, this firm brings a wealth of institutional knowledge and experience in ongoing labor relations issues with the city. Therefore, it makes sense to waive the competitive bidding provisions and emergency actions requested to allow for the continued representation as it relates to uh, ongoing collective bargaining negotiations and uh, related activities. Do I have my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee to come before Council is the Health and Human Services and Equity Committee, chaired by Councilmember Green. But I think I'm turning the floor over to Councilmember Faber. Uh, thank you, Council President Harden and Chair Green. Uh, tonight in the Health and Human Services and Equity Committee, we have Ordinance 053-2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to modify a grant agreement to add additional funds in the amount up to $10,750,000 of the U.S. Department of Treasury Emergency Rental Assistance II or ERA II funds to authorize the payment of eligible expenses and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the Director of the Department of Development to modify a grant agreement to add additional funds. These funds uh, will be uh, through the assistance with the Tony R. Wells Foundation doing business as the Wells Foundation to continue to act as a fiscal manager for the disbursement of ERA funds to eligible recipients as part of the department's ERA II investment strategy. In April of 2023, the City of Columbus received $68 million in final ERA II draw and reallocation from the U.S. Treasury. In July, the City implemented the 2023 ERA II program and legislated $27 million with the Wells Foundation and Greenwood and $4.8 million to 28 nonprofits for housing resource specialists. Since July of 2023, 8,444 households have been assisted with rent and utility assistance, and $34 million in ERA II rent and utilities funds have been spent. The need in our community is clearly large. However, federal funds are dwindling. To help slow down the spend in September of 2023, additional eligibility requirements were added. 
It was lowered to households at 50% AMI and limited the number of months for arages and future months. Excuse me. The city also ended up taking applications directly at court in January of 2024 to focus on preventing evictions prior to filings focusing on providing stability and services. Even with these modifications, we are spinning down the funds very quickly. This modification is essential to continue to provide rental, utility, and other services to residents facing household instability, eviction, or potential homelessness in the area who qualify for assistance. This additional 10.7 will enhance and empower housing resource specialists to target tenants most at risk of homelessness and eviction. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Deputy Director Aaron Prosser. Is there anything additional you would add? No, I think this is an important step to kind of uh, looking at using those funds most effectively to serve those most in need in our community. Um, and it's an important reallocation of those dollars to support those families. Thank you. I never want to miss an opportunity to thank all of our partners who have assisted the city with getting uh, this enormous amount of money out into the community for the last two and a half years, and as well to the Department of Development uh, for all your work. Uh, are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcower, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. That's all thank, I have in this committee. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, the next committee coming for Council is Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee, chaired by Councilman Remy. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. Tonight I have four ordinances in Public Safety and Criminal Justice. The first ordinance is 171 2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Finance and Management to enter into contract for the purchase of consumable supplies with Stryker Sales Corporation, the LLC, to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety on behalf of the Division of Fire to enter into preventative maintenance agreements with Stryker Sales. Sales Corporation LLC to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes to authorize the expenditure of $104,028.65 from the general front and to declare an emergency. In 2018 and 2019, the Division of Fire standardized on striker power load cots for emergency medical services. Stri striker power load cots are purchased on a continuing basis for installation in all new build emergency medical squads and striker consumable parts are purchased at regular intervals due to the normal daily utilization of these cots. The Division of Fire purchases these cots and supplies directly from Stryker versus a resale provider, which allows the division to secure the lowest pricing available. As the Division of Fire is standardized on the Stryker Power Load Cot product, it is critical that the division be able to maintain a stock of both this equipment and consumable supplies. Stryker Sales Corporation is a sole manufacturer, distributor, and authorized service agent for the Stryker Power Load Cots. Director, can you provide any more than I just said as it relates to the waiver of competitive bidding. Uh, Council President, Council Member Remy, I sure cannot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Passed. Next, seven ordinance 515 2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety on the behalf of the Division of Fire to enter into a contract with and issue a purchase order to Phoenix Safety Outfitters LLC for the alteration and repair of the Division of Fire's turnout gear to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes to authorize the expenditure of $100,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. This contract is necessary to fortify the safety of division personnel via efficient customization and repair of Lion first responder turnout gear from March 1st, 2024 through February 28, 2025. A waiver of competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code is necessary for this purchase as the expedient repair and customization of the division's turnout gear is vital to the safety of the division of personnel of division personnel and Phoenix Safety Outfitters is the only vendor within the state of Ohio that is authorized by Lion First Responder as per the National Fire Protection Association to make repairs and alterations on new and existing turnout gear manufactured by Lion First Responder. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have ordinance 520-2024 to authorize and direct the Finance and Management Director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate universal term contract purchase agreements with Life Assist, Inc., um, 
Bound Tree Medical LLC, Henry Schein Inc., Zoll Medical Corporation, and Teleflex LLC for the purchase of EMS pharmaceuticals and miscellaneous medical supplies for the Division of Fire to authorize the expenditure of $1,250,555 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. The Fire Division needs to purchase pharmaceuticals and miscellaneous medical supplies for use in daily emergency services and emergency medical service operations. The existing universal term contracts were established by the purchasing office for such purposes with each of the named um, companies, EMS medical supplies include, but are not limited to, bandage, bandages, IVs, pharmaceutical splints, face masks, gowns, gloves, etc. This legislation authorizes the finance and man management director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from the ordinance with the appropriate universal term purchase contract purchase agreements. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, De Aukauer, Dorrance, Favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. And last, I have uh, Ordinance 555-2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety to enter into contract with All Star Talent, Inc. for recruitment and marketing services to authorize the expenditure of $1 million from the general government grant fund and to declare an emergency. The Department of Public Safety was awarded the Ohio EMA ARPA first responder grant by the state of Ohio to help state and local first responder agencies bolster new recruitment. The Department of Public Safety requests to enter into a contract with All Star Talent Inc. to provide marketing and recruiting efforts toward recruiting new police officers, firefighters, and dispatchers. All Star Talent will perform functions for, which include but are not limited to recruiting marketing and consulting services, diversity, equity, and inclusion recruitment efforts, candidate tracking system, recruitment unit training, social media, digital production, and marketing implementation. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Thank Pass. you very much, Council President. That is all I have in public safety and criminal justice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, chaired by Councilmember White. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight in Public Utilities and Sustainability, I have two ordinances and one resolution to come before Council. Uh, first, I have Resolution 0029X-2024 to approve the Solid Waste Management Plan update for the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio as a guide for the management of solid waste and waste reduction activities. Uh, given the importance of um, uh, solid waste in the city of Columbus, I thought it would be um, effective to have the Executive Director of Swaco, Joe Lombardi, here to kind of speak to the plan. And as he is making his way up here, I'll just state that um, it is Swaco's responsibility to create a 15-year plan for managing solid waste in our jurisdiction. And they are required to update that plan every five years. And so wanted to give him a chance to just speak to the highlights briefly of the plan itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Hardin, Chairman Weich, members of council. My name is Joe Lombardi and I'm the executive director at Swaco. And just a quick background on who Swaco is. Swaco is one of 52 solid waste districts in Ohio. It was created by the state of Ohio through House Bill 592 in 1988. Uh, really the two big points of that House Bill were to reduce the reliance on our landfills and to implement programs for waste reduction such as recycling and reuse. Uh, we do serve all of Franklin County. About 1 million tons of material per year comes into our landfill, and 76% of that waste is recyclable, reusable, or compostable. So the Solid Waste Management Plan is really what we want to talk about this evening. is is statutorily required to be updated every five years. We need 60% 60, 60 approval from our 41 communities that we serve. It's really a roadmap and it has to show we have the financial ability to pay for the 15 years that it actually is. There is no fee increase included with this plan. We do generate revenue from a $5 per ton generation fee, which is about $6.5 million a year to our organization. In 2017, we removed a $7 fee. Many of us probably remember the former waste to energy facility. That was that $7 that we used to pay for the debt on that. We did retain $1 to use for additional support of our diversion programs. The plan includes a continuation of the programs that we already do. Plus, we're going to look more closely at food waste management roadmap, 
business recycling, hard to recycle materials, which we opened along with the city of Columbus, two convenience centers, one on Jackson Pike and one on Allen Creek for those hard to re recycle materials. We are gonna build a new education center on our property for the children of our communities and more staff to provide additional support to our communities. Again, I wanna thank council and Chairman Weich for allowing me a few moments of your night to talk about the solid waste management plan and uh, ask for your support of this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Lombardo, Lombardi, for being here and providing just a quick update. I just want to check with Interim Director Soko, see if you had any additional thoughts you wanted to share on the plan. I have no additional thoughts. All right, let me stop there and see if my colleagues have any questions or comments. All right, seeing none, I move to adopt this resolution via voice vote. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. de Alcauer? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Ms. Green? Same. Mr. Remy? Yes. Mr. Weich? Yes. President Hart? Yes. Adopted. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next, I have Ordinance 0176-2024 to authorize the Director of Department of Finance and Management to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate current and pending universal term contract purchase agreements for the purchase of materials, supplies, and services for the Division of Power and to authorize the expenditure of $2,675,000 from the Electricity Operating Fund. Uh, the purchases from these contracts will be used on the Division of Power's electrical distribution system to serve new and existing customers, as well as replenish stock for maintenance of existing infrastructure. Let me stop there and see if there are any questions or comments from my colleagues. Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Hart. Passed. Thank you. And last, I have Ordinance 0385-2024 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify and increase a contract with uh, Census USA, Inc. for ongoing software, hardware, and maintenance of systems for the Enhanced Meter Project for the Division of Water to authorize the expenditure of $650,000 from the Water Operating Fund and to waive competitive bidding provisions of city code. This contract is for the ongoing operations and maintenance of system and so systems and software to ensure that the system implemented is usable. This equipment is proprietary to the vendor, causing the need to waive competitive bidding. Let me stop there and see if there are any questions or comments from my colleagues. Seeing none, I move for passage. Sorry. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Cower, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you, and that is all I have come, uh, uh, for public utilities and sustainability. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, seeing no further business to come before council, just a reminder again that there is no council meeting this coming Monday, March 11th, that we will reconvene on Monday, March 18th for our next regular scheduled uh, council meeting. Is there a motion to uh, adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Cower, Dorans, Favor Green, Remy Weich, President Harden the meeting is adjourned. So we have again, um, continuation of a conversation that um, is happening right here in Columbus in what we say the people's house, the people's living room. And so again, we're gonna make half space uh, for that discussion um, like we've had, like we've done over the last five months. Um, last several weeks, it has worked to get the folks who are not speaking on the ceasefire portion of the agenda to speak first, and then we allow for the remainder of the time to be on that topic. Um, I think it's been agreed to that we can do that. So we have two of those speakers, and then we have four uh, uh, our community members who are here to speak on ceasefire that will follow uh, Mr. Nate Wilkins and Lori Blanchard. So uh, Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to council. Sixteen twelve Arlington Avenue, a resident for more than sixteen years. I uh, come to you the last time again with uh, sixteen twenty one of Genesee Avenue, 
and also 1617 of Tennessee Avenue. I noticed for a while their habitat had took over the old property of 1621 of Tennessee Avenue. It was an age old house. Um, it was built in 1923, and today there was another fire. Uh, there was a previous fire at these two properties, the beginning behind my house of uh, 1617 of Genesee Avenue of a 100 year old home. Uh, today I have watched the roof is being put on 1621 of a habitat house sitting on my patio with my wife. I don't understand here why that probably still sits in the city of Ohio that's burnt and torched and take decades to be torn down or decades to be rehabbed. Once again, I said to you a while back to get these young people off the street and giving them jobs and making $40 an hour. And let me say this why is because this is what I deal with every day going back and forth to work. I walk this block and to see a Habitat house being worked on and the other house is not being worked on. It's a daggone shame where I have to pay taxes on something that's catty corner from my property and to watch burnt furniture sitting in the yard time after time again. And like I said again, the owner had died. The owner had died. What can y'all do now as a body of a resident of a taxpayer where I have to walk in this mess every day to walk and it just shames me I, I created a book here, and all this does, it shows this property. To, to clarify something with me, when you talk about a boarded up property, that means not just the downstairs to be boarded up, it's the whole entire house. Today, me and my wife sat and drank coffee on my patio, and all these windows are open up here. And to mind you, to understand, what does this take? I'm here as a passionate person every week coming to you time after time again. You create some as an opportunity for residents, giving them a place, a, a stable place to stay. 1617 of Genesee Avenue was built over 100 years ago with Caddy Corner from another property, uh, 1607 of Genesee Avenue. These properties are eyesores in my community. They can be renovated for low income people, just like these people that sit here back here don't have a place to go. And here, when we talk about, we are talking about stable housing. These houses can be fixed up. I'm tired of crying the blues every time I come down here. There's no affordable housing in this community. But I see burnt property and habitat houses. I don't see nothing else going up in my community that's stable, flexible. Rent. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, uh, for your continued advocacy. The next speaker to come for counsel is Lori Blanchard. So you're welcome to counsel. Huh. Last week, I sat in a room where millions of dollars were distributed to programs like Experience Columbus. These programs were designed to attract visitors to Columbus in the hope of turning them into residents. Meanwhile, many existing Ohio residents are unhoused, an issue that the board hasn't addressed. This is unconscionable. In the recent meeting, Ms. Green brought up the topic of HIV programs that are, in theory, accessible to any individual who requires them. However, a critical oversight in her discourse was the lack of focus on the unhoused population. This group arguably needs the programs the most, yet they are often the most disconnected from such resources. The crux of the issue lies in the accessibility of the information. These unhoused individuals do not possess the means to access essential information about these programs. They do not own phones or have internet connectivity, which is the primary route for disseminating information about these programs. And even if they would like to try to access it by going to a library, numerous libraries might expel individuals because, quote, they don't look right or they're loitering, despite the fact that libraries are intended for public use. Additionally, transportation is another significant barrier. These programs may be spread across the city, and without reliable transportation, these venues become a hertilian task, 
Often unhoused people are unable to navigate the public transit system or cannot afford the fares, making the programs essentially inaccessible. This leads to a crucial question. If the most vulnerable sections of our society are unable to access these programs, then who are they genuinely helping? Are we simply creating programs that are theoretically sound but practically ineffective? Existing legislation, Grants Pass versus Johnson, which you may be aware of, seeks to criminalize the unhoused population. This is an operation that the CPD is already adept at, as evidenced by their camp sweeps. At last week's city hall meeting, I couldn't help but notice the presence of no less than four police officers. If their purpose was not to intimidate, then what was it? The CPD's practice of employing intimidation and oppressive policies during camp sweeps against the unhoused population is deeply troubling. These individuals are not provided with access to housing resources. Instead, they are compelled to leave the areas where they've set up camps, and their meager possessions are frequently destroyed in the process. Despite this, they are still expected to relocate. But the question remains, where can they go when they have nowhere to go? When you force unhoused individuals to relocate, it can potentially increase the spread of HIV. This is due to the dispersion of the unhoused population across a larger area. Returning to Grants Pass, AP News recently published an article about the connection between prison labor and the multi-million dollar brands like Kroger, Target, Aldi, and Whole Foods. While this unsurprising to those who have been attentive, including those advocates like you see here today, is likely that most people were caught off guard by this news. This raises the question, how can the efforts to criminalize homelessness in Grants Pass and the increasing use of prison labor across industries where inmates have paid are paid extremely low wages, pennies, not dollars, be unconnected. For example, a prisoner in California who works as a janitor just donated his earnings for 136 hours of work to Gaza and amounted to $17.74. That's 13 cents an hour. 13 cents. It seems peculiar that while rent, food, and gas prices are rising, and everyone is demanding higher wages to survive, an issue as significant as this one in Grants Pass is emerging, yet many cities are overlooking it. It's also worth noting that many prisons are transitioning from state-run to for-profit models. Additionally, profits are still generated through overpriced services like JPay and Commissary, as well as companies who have vending machines in the visitors' rooms, so these companies have a vested in interest in Grants Pass becoming law. Last week, Mr. Hinder commented that if the weather stayed as pleasant as it was that day, he would gladly attend a game. Those sitting near me exchanged disapproving glances. His comment failed to acknowledge that the pleasant weather was a result of global warming. In fact, global warming has reached a critical level, surpassing the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase that our oceans can withstand. We've reached global boiling. The unhoused population is affected by global warming the most. Without a roof over their heads, they are not only the first to experience extreme weather changes, but also the most impacted by them. For instance, during an extreme cold snap a few weeks ago, I learned of at least three individuals who froze to death. The city of Ms. Columbus Ms. claims there are warming stations available yet again, and it's, it's an accessibility issue. In extreme heat, these unsheltered residents have no means to cool themselves and a lack of access to resources. They may end up dying from heat exhaustion. Furthermore, those who try to provide them with temporary relief, such as food or space, are subjected to harassment or fines if they can't get a permit due to Title IX, as has been shown in numerous videos by organizations such as Food Not Bombs. Why is the city of Columbus permitting all of this to occur? At the beginning of this meeting, you said with liberty and justice for all, but that is not what we're seeing in the city. Instead of viewing unhoused residents as an annoyance, why not address them as citizens of the city? These individuals are residents of Columbus. Whether you acknowledge it or not, they remain your responsibility. As members of the Columbus City Council, it is your duty to be responsible and serve everyone in our community, not just those who contribute to the city's aesthetics or finances. <laughs> So on that topic of unhoused, the portion that was on our unhoused population, council looks forward to an announcement this week about how we continue to step up and to support um, the long work. I know council member Green and her work well before she got to council has been um, in this population as well as the rest of my colleagues. So we look forward to come back to the community later this week um, to continue that conversation. As for um, 
you know, a reason, the reason a lot of folks have, are, are here this evening, we want to, again, open up space for us to uh, hear from you. Um, but tonight also, I'm going to ask my colleagues if they have anything that they would like to say on this issue around a ceasefire, that they are certainly uh, welcome to do so. Uh, we have, uh, I said four uh, speakers on ceasefire. I was mistaking, mistaken. We're going to allow for uh, the six folks who have signed up to speak. So this will take a minute, but we will get through. If you listen with us, we will be able to listen with you. If, if we are not able to, then we will uh, have to move forward. If we can have a discussion and, and engage, um, then, then that's what we will do. Um, I would, I'm going to start off by just you know, acknowledging that we are on the eve of Ramadan, of Passover, and Easter. And it's a holy season when our highest calling must be for peace and for mercy, not vengeance and hate. Over the last five months, we've heard from our residents on many Monday nights, most Monday nights. We've heard from Palestinian residents whose families have been killed, folks who have channeled their pain into advocacy. We've also heard inside this chamber and outside of it from Jewish folks, from black pastors, from Dominican nuns, from union members, from doctors and social workers, students, and many others who feel we are living in a moment of conviction. If it is self-evident that when two parties are fighting before they can agree on what comes next, that violence simply has to stop. Because you can't negotiate when your children are starving or when your homes are being bombed, when an entire generation is being traumatized by violence and hate and fear. Many, though, want to see council pass a ceremonial resolution to that effect making it official policy of this city that we support a ceasefire. But ultimately, for this council to pass a resolution on the conflict abroad, we would need to have consensus among ourselves and among our community, and we do not. And I'm sad to say that as the conflict has worsened, those divisions have only deepened. Many residents have told me that the word ceasefire has become fraught that instead of a call for peace, it has become a signal of side talking. I've heard from the Jewish community that passing a resolution calling for a ceasefire will make them also feel unsafe in their own neighborhoods. I want to, sorry about that. I want to see the Israeli government end its bombing campaign and Hamas to free its hostages immediately. But right now, I am comfortable coming forth with a ceremonial resolution, if it means even one person in our community feels less safe right here in Columbus where we live. Even though, even though I would argue that the, that the longer this conflict continues, the more this tension builds, the more dangerous it becomes for all of us. Several members of this body, several members of this body had hoped uh, that passing something could create a common ground between people who are hurting so that someday when we come back together, uh, we could be a credible convener of peace here in Columbus. But for the time as this is right now, that need, there is no needle fine enough to thread these goals. I don't regret that we have gone through this process of listening and I don't apologize that we tried to get there. This has been a conversation. Do you, we still want to get to the speakers, but I want to open it up to any of my colleagues who would also like to speak, or and then we can go to the speaker portion of the meeting. Principal Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Council President. The war. We're going to try that again. The war in Gaza is at the center of the minds for many in this city, many of the people that are here. The pain of both the brutal October 7th Hamas a a terrorist attack against the Israeli people and the subsequent deaths of tens of thousands of Palestinians in the ensuing war in Gaza is felt here in Columbus. As a city council member in a Midwestern city, I am certainly not a foreign policy expert. But it does not take it. 
if you let me keep speaking. As I was saying, it does not take an expert to conclude that the bloodshed in Gaza must come to an end. This violence being waged with innocence on both sides caught in the middle, a sustainable political resolution must be found. Where hostages are safely released and humanitarian aid can get to the people who desperately need it in Gaza. Israel has a right to exist. Palestine has a right to exist. Both of these statements are deeply true and not mutually exclusive. For decades, U.S. foreign policy has called for a two-state solution which gives both the Israelis and the Palestinian people the rights of self-determination, dignity, and sovereign state of their own. That should remain the goal to bring this generation's long conflict to a lasting peace. Two countries with two peoples coexisting next to one another peaceably as they do right here in Columbus. It is my hope that the diplomatic efforts of the Biden administration, congressional leaders are working towards an end of this war. To bring this war to an end as soon as possible in a long-term path forward that ensures security for the Israeli people and a sovereign state for Palestine to allow both people to live in peace. It is difficult to find universal common ground in any issue. And this council is no different. I had hoped that this body would be able to speak with one voice on this issue that has affected so many in our community. However, absent a joint action of council, I wanted to take the time to make clear that my heart aches for countless families that have been affected by this war. And I believe in Columbus, we should all endeavor to stand united against anyone who expresses anti-Islamic, anti-Palestinian, anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic rhetoric are threatening acts of violence in our community. Excuse me, Press Pro Tim. If you continue to use language, when I allow the, the videos to, uh, to continue, I will cut the video screen. If you will use language that cannot be in our, in our community, I will cut the video. Would any other council member like to speak? We'll, we'll go. Would you like to go? No, I heard curse words several times. Look, I cut the cut the screen. Cut the cut them.
turn it out. Turn it out. Thank you, President Hardin, council members, and members of the community. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. I stand before you today. It's been five months, 149 days, since the October 7th events. It's been over 75 years, nine months, and 18 days since the ethnic cleansing project of Palestine started. And it's been 106 years and four months and two days since a white British colonizer made a declaration promising my ancestral land to a European movement and, de and degraded 90% of its indigenous people, the lawful owners of 97% of the land, to the, ca to the category of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. I'm not going to go into a historical, historical review. As esteemed, as esteemed council members, I'm sure you are already well aware and well versed about the subject. For the past five months, we have been having meetings um, individually and in groups. We have spoken to you, um, a diverse coalition has spoken to you about everything that's happening in Palestine. And I don't want to go back and relitigate and restate and go back to the same information again. Just a few days ago, we hoped and we thought that there would be a resolution passed by this council. In our one-on-one -on -one meetings, almost every council member who we went with said that they support a ceasefire. They have said that to us in these meetings. You have said that there are people who are against the ceasefire resolution, yet we have not seen them or heard from them up to this day. Yeah. We have not. And in the past five months, 
just for some numbers to think of. Over 30,000 Palestinians have been massacred. They have been killed. 12,300 of those are children. 8,400 are women. Over 70,000 Palestinians have been injured. 11,000 of them are in critical conditions. More than 8,000 remain missing under the rubble. More than 10 children every day, 10 children every day on average, have a limb amputated in Gaza. 1.8 million have been internally displaced. You know about the hunger. You know about the blocking of access of humanitarian aid and food to Gaza. You know about this all. You know that 420 Palestinians in the West Bank have been also killed. Of them, 110 children. Yesterday, one child, two, two, feet, two blocks away from my house in Palestine, in the Ramallah, was killed by the Israeli military. We know that there is over 7,000 Palestinians kidnapped by Israel without being, without being charged or tried or have any rights in Israeli prisons. Those are also hostages that you should think of when you say release of hostages. We know about all these things. I told you, President Hardin, five months ago that my relative, the city council president of my city in Palestine, Al-Bira, Islam al-Tawil, was taken hostage by Israel for just being a city council president. Up to this day, he is still being held hostage by Israel without charges, without trial, without nothing. He's a city council president. Imagine if something happens to you like that. Imagine if an administration comes to this country and takes you hostage for your color or your race or your ethnicity or your background. How would you want your constituents and community to react? Would you like us to... Would you like us to sit silent and not do anything? Because that's not what you want. And that's not what we would do. We would stand up for every human right, every human being, no matter what their color or their race or their religion or their background, we stand for them. And this is what this coalition is about. A few weeks ago, a U.S. District Court judge, Judge White in California, dismissed a case that was brought against the Biden administration for its complicity in the genocide in Gaza. Even though he dismissed the case, he insisted on stating that based on the record and evidence that he's seen, this is a plausible case of genocide. He dismissed the case. He had no obligation to say any further because he dismissed it based on jurisdictional issues. But he insisted on saying these because he's a person of moral, he's a person of ethics, he's a person who insists that what needs to be said must be said. And he did not hide or fear for his position, for his election, or for his next role in government. He said what had to be said. Today we're asking you, out of courtesy at least, for all of those who have been coming every single Monday, for all of those who have been meeting with you, for all those people who are hurt, who have lost family members and loved ones in Palestine, we ask you, we have heard from a few of you today, we have heard that you support a ceasefire resolution. And we also heard that there's others who don't agree. Please, eight members of city council and council president, by the end of this evening, tell those people, tell us for the record, the record that your children would see in the future, where did you stand in the time of a genocide? Tell them that. Without, without, Without political speech, without political speech, or spinning words, or going into these details. A very simple question, with a simple yes or no answer. Do you support an immediate, permanent ceasefire in Gaza and Israel? That's it. That's all what we want from you. That is all what we want from you. We thank you for your time and for meeting with us, because others in this city and in the state have refused. The mayor of this city, the mayor of the city has refused to meet with any single one of us for the past five months. The congresswoman of this city, Joyce Beatty, has refused to meet with a single one of us up to this time. The senator of the state, the progressive senator, Brown, has refused to meet with any single one of us. So we thank you for that time, but we hope that we, we did not waste that time. We hope that, that as humans, we could hear each other and understand each other and see each other and understand the pain that's going through us for the past five months. We hope to hear from you. Thank you. And thank you for giving me this time.
the next speaker to come before council is Jennifer Sucklin. Suchlin. Welcome to council. Good evening, President Hardin, members of the council. My name is Jennifer Suchland, and I live in Columbus, Ohio. Over the past 16 years, I have canvassed for Senator Sherrod Brown and gone to the polls to vote for many of you on this council. I have walked the streets of Columbus to protest police brutality and even stood just a few feet away from Council President Hardin and Joyce Beatty at one of the many uprisings of summer 2020. I joined the council in solidarity when the Christopher Columbus statue was removed from City Hall. I remind you, a very unpopular decision. I was proud when the council passed another unpopular resolution to show support for Edith Espinal and Miriam Vargas, who were living in sanctuary at the time. I know many of you have spoken the words, Black Lives Matter, and other words for justice. We urgently must also speak the words, permanent ceasefire now. The forces that keep you from passing a ceasefire resolution are not the ethical compass provided by the International Court of Justice, who affirmed that Israel is plausibly committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. Nor are they accountable to the leading international, Palestinian, and Israeli human rights organizations who have long argued that Israel's occupation of Palestine constitutes a cruel system of apartheid and a crime against humanity. You may ask, what does Columbus have to do with Palestine? When Franklin County invested 2.5 million in Israel bonds and Ohio Treasurer Sprague announced the state will purchase 30 million worth of Israel bonds, our well-being in Columbus became linked to the life and death of Palestinians. We know for a fact that these investments are direct investments in the IDF and their acts of genocide in Gaza. The city and the state literally have blood on their hands. We also are uniquely called to speak out and oppose Israel's genocidal acts that they are doing in the name of self-protection. The rationale of self-protection in Israel is the same given here in the lands that became Ohio. In the 18th century, the, North, uh, in the, 18th century, uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 contained a clause stating just and lawful reasons for war. When native tribes defended their treated lands against rogue settlers, land speculators, and military expansion, the government reasoned that their genocidal acts of war were just and lawful. Similarly, Palestinians face an impossible reality, either succumb to their slow death and displacement or fight back. I do not condemn the killing of civilians by Hamas, but Israel has no just or lawful cause to kill over 30,000 Palestinians, more than 40% of whom are children or to leave the people and nature still standing in dire existence. In Columbus, we have a specific responsibility to demand a ceasefire in Gaza now. Thank you. The next speaker to come before council is Dalal Shalash. Shala, uh, Sh I apologize. I haven't been here in a minute, so to reintroduce myself, my name is Dalal, and I am an undergrad at OSU studying history. 
the, the reason I study history is because, as counterintuitive as it may sound, the best way to illuminate the present is the study of the past. History is one of the only disciplines that is not, only, not, not a body of knowledge, but rather a way of thinking, a way of approaching and understanding the world. So I was sitting in my civil rights history course this morning when we were learning about the murder of the 14-year-old Emmett Till and how that became a catalyst for the civil rights movement. However, Emmett Till wasn't the only black boy, was by no means the only black boy to be falsely accused and brutally murdered at the hands of white people in the South. What separated the case of Emmett Till, what sparked a movement, was the decision of his mother to keep his casket open. The sight of his brutalized body pushed many people who were otherwise not involved in the movement, who had been complacent or otherwise scared to question the status quo of American society into action. The American public was so inexperienced with direct images, imagery of violence, the mutilation, for lack of a better word, of a young boy sparked profound and historic change. What does it say then about the progression of our society that we are somehow numbed or unmoved at the image of children starving, at the accounts of the rape of women, at the obliteration of almost 40,000 people that we are witnessing quite literally at our fingertips? I, actually, I'd like to rescind that statement. What does that say about you? The fact that you have a community of people who have been in here since October practically, practically begging you to find a shred of humanity, to acknowledge the human dignity of an oppressed people, to do the bare minimum that is garnered by being a decent person with some form of moral compass, and the fact that you have been unwilling or unable is a testament to a few things. First, this council has historically and continuously negated the needs of the most vulnerable members of its communities. This extends from Gaza to Columbus, where we have seen the brutalization of Palestinians by the IDF, the same IDF that is training our CPD officers that have murdered, at the top of my head, Casey Christopher Johnson Jr., Taikia Young, Donovan Lewis. We have gone from a society where the killing of a black boy means movement and outrage to now one that doesn't only not condemn these murders, but continues to take free trips to genocidal governmental bodies. Jalen Walker, Henry Green, Andre Hill, our history has led us into a present that sees our leaders not only not condemn an act in the face of brutalization of their own community, but sees that extended to the most vulnerable and helpless in the world. Tyree Nickel, Tyree King, who was 13 years old. He was 13 years old and not a statement. Nothing was released by this council as a whole. The second thing, your unwillingness to pass a resolution is a testament to, aside from being metaphoric of how you are approaching violence in your direct community, is you are now writing the history of this council being complacent in genocide. I hate the saying of we are living through a historic moment. To live in the present is to live through a historic moment. Instead, what is being written is how we respond and interact in that moment, and I have no qualms in saying you are failing miserably. Yeah! It has been five months. You know what could have happened? You know what could have, ha what could have gotten done in those five months had governmental institutions, had the leaders we appointed, had the systems of government that we have put into place from the local to the international level called for a ceasefire, a call that is reflected in the majority of opinion of, uh, in the American public. History won't either. What it will know is how the world failed Gaza, how you failed Gaza, and how we have collectively gone from a society that is horrified at the sight of a 14-year-old boy killed to one that does not even acknowledge, symbolically nonetheless, the murders of Tyre King, a 13-year-old boy in Columbus, to my cousins Kais and Khalil Shalash, 18 and 16-year-old boys in Palestine. We are here today to, if nothing else, ask you to learn from our colonial past Learn from the past five months for Allah's sake. Learn from the mistakes because in, because in all honesty, they have been profound. And help illuminate the present for Palestinians and inshallah, Columbus citizens, as well as history for generations to come. Thank you. The next speaker to come before council is Ali Stein. Uh, 
Um, I have prepared remarks, but before I start those, I want to talk about Amir uh, Najjar. Uh, before I left my office uh, to come here, I saw two pictures of Amir. Uh, one was of him proudly holding up a diorama of the solar system that he'd made. The other picture of Amir was Amir on a stretcher, dead. He'd been shot in the head by an IDF soldier. Amir lived in the West Bank, and he was 10 years old. There's no Hamas in the West Bank. Amir was 10 years old. I have a son who just turned 10 last Monday. And looking at those pictures, all I could see was my son. I want to read something that James Baldwin said. <clears throat> the children are always ours, every single one of them, all over the globe. And I am beginning to suspect that whoever is incapable of recognizing this may be incapable of morality. My prepared. Uh, my name is Allie Stein. I am a mother of two. I'm an accountant at my family's firm here in Columbus. I have lived in Columbus my entire life. I'm also a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, a grassroots organization started in 1996. And now with 750,000 members nationwide and growing, we are the largest anti-Zionist group of Jewish people in the country, but we are not the only anti-Zionist group of Jewish people in the country. I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to live in Columbus. My grandfather was born in 1929 in Belarus. He was 11 years old when the Nazis invaded his town, turned it into a ghetto, and turned him into an orphan. Three decades later, my grandparents and their young daughters, my mother and aunt, fled their home country, a country still very intolerant of Jews, and were placed in Columbus as part of a refugee program. My family has always spoken glowingly of their first months in Columbus, how welcoming the community was despite the fact that they barely spoke English. Since October 7th, my Palestinian friends have been telling me how scared and unwelcome they feel here in Columbus, how they are heckled and followed while simply walking down the street wearing the scarf I wear now. Last November, a family friend graduated from OSU with honors and had to cancel her graduation party because her family was too scared to be a group of people in hijab in public. Is this the Columbus that you, our city council, feel proud of? Is this the Columbus culture that you, our city council, feel like you have helped cultivate? My identity as a Jewish descendant of a Holocaust survivor informs so much of why I fight for a ceasefire and for a free Palestine. I want Columbus... I want Columbus to feel like the welcoming city my immigrant family remembers. I want it to feel like the, same, like the same place that finally made my Holocaust survivor grandfather feel safe and at home. I want it to feel this way for everyone who calls this city home. James Baldwin, the civil rights activist, wrote, the place in which I'll fit will not exist until I make it. I want us to help make Columbus a place in which all of us can fit. By passing a ceasefire resolution, we will all fit better. I'm here today urging city council to call for a ceasefire because my grandfather taught me that never again means never again for anyone, everywhere. I do it because it is the right thing to do. I do it because I have two sons, 10 and 8, and I want them to feel proud of me and the things I fought for in the same way I feel proud of my grandfather. I hope that you will make your families proud today as well.
I just want to say something else. To say that the word ceasefire is fraught is not the systematic killing of children fraught. The next speaker to come before council is uh, Bruce Bostic, followed by Ryan McCarthy. Mr. Bostic. The last speaker to come before council is Ryan McCarthy. Thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. I'm a resident of this city. I am a person with a conscience. I simply call on the city council to join other city councils in our country that have passed ceasefire resolutions. It is a matter of conscience. It is a matter of children being killed. That's all I have to say. Please do the right thing. Thank you. I had Jenna uh, as a speaker as well on the, but it was, so we will, since in Bruce's absence, we'll allow Jenna to speak and Jenna will be our last speaker. My name is Jenna Al-Akhras, I'm a long time, or a lifelong Columbus resident um, and an immigration attorney. And I wrote my statements before hearing that members of this council uh, had some statements prepared. And to those of you who were courageous enough to call for a ceasefire, I'd like to extend my thank yous. Um, but to the rest of the council. Columbus City Council happened an opportunity to be a trailblazer in Ohio. You had that opportunity on October 17th when hundreds packed this room and asked you to see their collective humanity, to represent them and to condemn the genocide perpetuated by Israel. You have had that opportunity seven times because that is how many times this room has been packed to the brim. But the Columbus City Council has now failed to lead as neighboring cities such as Dayton, Athens, Yellow Springs, and Toledo have passed similar resolutions to the ones requested here. So I am here to tell you, to this Columbus City Council, that you have failed your community. You have failed to take a stance that's worth anything. You have failed to see your community, the only people who have consistently given your meetings an audience for the past five months. And finally, you have failed to represent this community because your community has told you time and time again that the values that represent them are integrity, equality, and freedom. You have somehow even found yourselves later to the party than the Biden administration, as just yesterday. As just yesterday, Kamala Harris called for an immediate six-week ceasefire. So while, I'll, while I am fully expecting the Columbus City Council to continue to fail, when asked to rise to the occasion, I've decided to take this opportunity to inform you of exactly what it is that you refuse to take a stand against in the past 48 hours. This past weekend, over 100 Palestinians were killed while trying to collect humanitarian aid. They are calling it the flower massacre because people were looking for flour and the bags of flour that were found afterwards were drenched in blood. Israeli tanks deliberately ran over dozens of Palestinians. I saw the images with my own eyes. Dozens were killed in Rafah, including the children of a woman who spent 11 years trying to conceive her twins who were born just four months ago. Over a dozen children have died of malnutrition. One, named Yezen, was a 10-year-old with cerebral palsy. I will live with these stories for the rest of my life. 
Because even if I can't personally change the course of history, it is my moral obligation to try and to speak and to demand that you listen. And when you inevitably fail, you cannot say that you didn't know. Last night, Jewish Voice for Peace put out a call out at 9.30 p.m. to submit emails to the Columbus City Council. 9.30. As of 5 p.m. today, 936 people emailed City Council. 936 people who are not in this room emailed this council asking you to find your collective humanity. 30,000 people are dead, 72,000 are wounded, 7,000 are missing, and the collective Columbus City Council doesn't have the courage, strength, or resolve to demand that that come to an end. My faith demands courage. It demands strength, and it demands resolve. As the holy month of Ramadan is upon us, I pray for justice and that the tide of progress is never dependent on the will of this council for me because it too will certainly fail. Thank you. This is the People's House, and we come here for conversations, and council will continue to listen. Uh, like I said when I first uh, started this portion, that, this, that I pray for peace and immediate peace. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, in not passing a resolution that said one word, that it means, uh, means so much to so many in this room and to, around the community. With that, we will reconvene for zoning Mayor, shortly. Benny, Archer, we have not heard from you today.
Call the roll. Bangston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. We'll now go to the zoning committee. Uh, President Pro Tem Dorans chairs that many. All members serve on it. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, before we begin tonight's zoning agenda, allow me to briefly explain our current rules pertaining to speaking before Council on rezonings and variances. We only hear a staff presentation for ordinances that have a disapproval from recommending body or if we have a public speaker signed up to speak against an ordinance. Tonight, we have two public speakers signed up to speak. Uh, all speakers in the Council variance, including city staff, area commissioners, applicants, and members of the public will be sworn in be before they give testimony. Representatives of an area commission and applicants are always able to speak in an ordinance and do not need to fill out a speaker slip. Um, on the advice of the city attorney's office, I will now swear in city staff. Please stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, nothing but the truth, as you shall answer in a painter penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. Thank you. Please let the record reflect that Joseph Rose from the Department of Billions and Zoning Services and Daniel Bleschman from the Department of Public Service have been sworn in. First, we have Ordinance 0546-2024 to rezone 697 East Broad Street being 0.76 plus acres located in the southeast corner of East Broad Street and Parsons Avenue from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD commercial plan development district. The site consists of five parcels developed with an office building and parking. The request of rezoning will update the allowed uses while conforming the site's existing conditions. The proposal has approvals from city staff, development commission, and Near East Area Commission. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance 0561-2024 to rezone 1884 Genesee Avenue, being uh, 0.34 plus acres located at the northeast corner of Genesee Avenue and Joyce Avenue from R4 Residential District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The site consists of, consists of two parcels developed with a parking lot along Genesee Avenue. The requested rezoning will conform the existing parking lot. The pro proposal has approval from city staff, development commission, and northeast area commission. Uh, do my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcoward, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Amend it. Thank you. And now I move to amend for pa I, I move for passage as amended. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcoward, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Uh, pass. Thank you. Next, we have moving to the Council Variances portion of our agenda. We have first Ordinance 0566-2024 during the variance provisions of Section 3332.039 R4 Residential District 3312.49C required parking and 3325.801 maximum lot coverage, 3325.805 maximum floor area ratio. Um, 3332.05A4 area district lot width requirements, 3332.15R4 area district requirements, 3332.19 fronting, 3332.25 maximum side yard required, and 3332.26 minimum side yard permitted, and 3332.27 rear yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1462-1466 Hamlet Street to allow two unit dwelling on each lot with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district. Uh, the site consists of two parcels, each developed with a single unit dwelling. The requested council variance will allow the applicant to construct a single unit carriage house above the detached garage on each lot. Uh, a council variance is required because the current district allows a maximum of four units in one building, but does not allow two unit, uh, two, two single unit dwellings on one lot. The proposal has approvals from city staff and the university area commission. We did receive two public speaker slips uh, uh, to speak against this ordinance. So we will now hear a staff presentation from Mr. Uh, Joseph Rose. Mr. Rose, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Dorns, members of council. As the chair stated, the site is two separate parcels, each with an existing single unit dwelling. The requested council variance will allow the construction of a new single unit dwelling or a carriage house at the rear of each lot. The variance request is necessary because while the R4 district allows for single unit, two unit, and a residential building containing a maximum of four dwelling units, it does not allow for two single unit dwellings on one lot. The request also includes variances for lot coverage, lot area floor ratio, lot width, lot area, fronting, side yards for both the existing dwellings and the proposed carriage houses, rear yard, and a required parking reduction from four required spaces per lot to two provided spaces on each lot. The size within the planning boundaries of the University District Plan, which recommends lower intensity residential land uses at this location. Staff is supportive of the request 
as the proposal is consistent with the existing residential development pattern of the neighborhood. Additionally, there are also multiple previous counts of variances for two single unit dwellings on a lot in the immediate area, including behind the subject site, and therefore does not add an incompatible use to the area. Therefore, city staff's recommendation is for approval. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Any questions from my colleagues to the department at this time? Seeing none, I will invite uh, the applicant and the representative uh, to the podium, uh, Mr. Ugo Ogwawe. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name. If you want to make correct the record for me, I'd appreciate it. And I believe we have Mr. Uh, Dunita Strickland as well. And I'm going to swear both of you in uh, when you get to the podium, if you wouldn't mind. If you wouldn't mind, uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth that you shall answer the pains of penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Uh, name is uh, Ugo Moke. Uh, good evening. Um, the property, thanks again for the description. Uh, the addition we're trying to make is at the rear of the boat properties. Um, it's basically allowing parking spaces for the main build in the front. Um, we've um, worked with Joe to make sure we um, obviously stay within the framework of the uh, uh, vicinity. Um, Obviously, there are several variances that have been applied for, um, which obviously allowed us to, in terms of like, as he has mentioned earlier, uh, to make sure we conform to the, uh, uh, the requirement to successfully have the building on site. Um, in addition to what he said, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that the council, the team here will allow us to proceed with this. It doesn't uh, in any way demean with the local um, area. Uh, we've conformed with the architecture, the vernacular of the, of the area as well, and I'm hoping that we'll end up with a positive uh, outcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Strickland, do you have anything to add? I do. Right. Uh, any questions from council members, the applicant, or the representative at this time? Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, we may call you back up after uh, we have the public speakers, so if you want to return to the gallery, uh, I'll let you know. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Um, the first public speaker we have again, to speak up against the ordinance, is Mr. Austin Heinz. Mr. Heinz? Yes. Please uh, come to the podium. And I will swear you in as well. Please uh, raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and not, nothing but the truth as you shall answer in pain to penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you. So my name is Austin Hens. Uh, my wife and I are the owners and occupants of 1458 Hamlet Street. Uh, this is the house next door to 1462 and 1466 Hamlet Street, uh, which is also known as Hamlet Properties LLC. Um, we are opposed to the buildings of garages with apartments above them on these properties. These houses were purchased a year and a half ago and remodeled to be short-term rentals, Airbnbs. One of the houses has been utilized as a short-term rental and to this day, while the other house continued to be remodeled. We are concerned that these properties are trans transitioning from single family houses to apartment complexes, or what is essentially a hotel with multiple short term rentals. The alley behind our properties is very narrow, and with Hamlet Properties LLC attempting to maximize their use of space, we have concerns that the alley will become more crowded and more frequently blocked. I have been a teacher in Columbus City Schools for 13 years. Four years ago, when my wife and I decided to buy a house, we were committed to living within the district. After some research into different communities and development plans, we decided on Wyland Park. This was because of the diversity, the location, and the Wyland Park neighborhood plan that was put forth as a guiding plan by the city of Columbus. Our backyard and garden acts as a private extension of our home, and having an apartment or a short-term rental overlooking us is very much a concern, especially with a newborn baby. We think the plan to maximize rental space on these properties will lead to further issues with infrastructure and safety in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions or comments from council members? Thank you. Um, the next public speaker we have to uh, send to speak on this ordinance is Mr. Robert Day. Mr. Day, welcome to council. Please uh, raise your right hand and I'll swear you in real quick. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, nothing but the truth, that you shall answer to pains of felony of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Floor is yours, sir. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. 
I'm Robert Day. I live in, uh, in Clintonville currently, but I used to live in the building immediately adjacent to the, uh, the, the properties that have recently been developed. So I lived in 247 East 9th Avenue, and I also own the other three units in the, that brick, unit, uh, brick townhouse building. There are four units in that building that I own, and they look immediately onto the, the two properties that have been recently redeveloped, and they immediately face the, uh, the parking area that's going to be turned into the, uh, the new unit with the, with the carriage houses. So it'll affect me probably almost more than anybody else. So partly I'm not mad about the idea just because there's going to be a reduction in the lights hitting the back of my window, but there will be less light in the house in general. I know that's not something that's really a part of a, a the zoning board's concern, but, but I'm much more concerned about parking. So uh, I lived in that, one of those units for 25 years. I'm extremely protective of my tenants there. I've been providing low-income housing to the neighborhood for you know, close to 30 years now. I'm very emotionally attached to those buildings because I did all the work on them myself. I have all the scars on my hands to prove it too as well. Um, but the 25 years that I was living there, parking was always very freely available. Street parking was always easy to find outside that building. In the last two years, suddenly the number of cars that we do not recognize parked outside our building has spiked dramatically. And now typically it's extremely difficult or totally impossible to find a parking place. Unfortunately, we have no other options for parking. Those houses were all built at a time long before cars really existed. There's really nowhere else that we can build a driveway or perhaps there's a possibility of eventually like asphalting the entire backyard. Well, I know there'd be zoning problems associated with that too as well. So our only option right now is street parking outside the building. I'm in, I'm in one of those units at least two days a week. I use one of those units as my office space and a base of operations for my uh, activities in South Campus. And I can never find a parking place there anymore. I can't assume that that has anything to do with the two new short uh, rent term rentals, but I, I know that's part of the problem because uh, uh, the sudden spike in unavailability of parking places is tied to the appearance of those short term rentals, it would seem. Um, so, uh, but but I'm, I'm happy to see that the, uh, the the neighborhood is getting investment. I'm happy to see those houses rehabbed. I have no uh, philosophical problem with the rehab of those houses and no philosophical problem even with the structure that's being proposed. I'm just looking for creative solutions to our own personal parking problems in there. And even if that means now asking the city to explain uh, to us a little bit more about maybe starting to have a permit parking on East 9th Avenue or something, that's a possibility. Problem is parking for us. That's our immediate concern. Uh, thank you, Mr. Day. Any questions from council members? I do want to ask the, the department, so that there is a parking reduction that's been requested. So what, what, was, what does the variance grant um, permit compared to what it would, would have been required without the variance? Uh, Chair Dorns, uh, each dwelling unit is required to have two off-street parking spaces. Uh, currently, with the proposal, it would only provide for two parking spaces for two dwelling units on each lot. So we're talking about two lots, or four total parking spaces as opposed to what would be eight required. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Day. Any questions from council members for Mr. Day? Yeah, um, just, well, I guess the question in that same line with parking. On, on this site, I'm seeing a, a, a driveway that bisects the site. Where, who parks there? Or what, are that, what is that parking for? Who's that question for? Yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Day. I, I think yeah. that's for the department. For the department. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Or applicant, whoever can answer it. The, on the site plan, it, it, there looks to be a driveway that is bisected. Mr. Day, I'm going to let you go back to the, I'm going to invite the applicant to come up because I think there may be some answers from them with the department as well. All right, on sorry, this one. Mr. Chair. Nope, apologize. all good. Please come on up. So um, on the uh, question you asked, um, that... Uh, space is actually going to be turned into a green space. Um, so the, uh, even though it's showing at the moment that, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about the hatch in the middle, right? Correct. Right now. Yeah, correct. I mean, right. even on the... So that is going to be the, there's a paving at the moment that we're going to remove that and then turn that into a green space because we obviously have parking spaces at the back, the two parking spaces at the back. So my discussion with Joe, um, one of the conditions was to remove the paving over there and turn it into a, into a green space, obviously to increase the green uh, lawn count. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, can I, if you don't mind, I also want to point out a few things that were mentioned earlier. Hmm? Um, 
my client is not intending to use the property for hotel services or stuff like that. Uh, it's actually for a single family home. Each of them are single family homes and the new structure is just an auxiliary uh, structure to the main, to the main building. Um, so there's no intention to have rowdy occupants in the space, as per se. What is, uh, so I just want to point that out. And, I mean, I also believe by adding the property at the back will actually help improve the value of the property, of the overall property. So there is a positive uh, intention by my client to doing this. I like, I like to ask the sure. applicant. My name is Denota Strickland. I'm the applicant, the owner. The, the parking spaces for the garages will suffice for the people that will be inside the, the, the ADUs. It's, it's a one bedroom, so you're looking at a maximum of two people, you know, possibly one. So if you got two parking spaces, two garages, that's going to yeah. suffice for that. Along with when I purchased the property, the, that alley, that, that uh, area on both properties, it was condemned. It was not used. The owner basically just sabotaged that area. So they never had parking space back there for the whole it's actually, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Now. It's actually it's full of debris and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. so, it, yeah. so it was never in use. So yeah. now it's actually it's being revitalized and being able to be used. So, Mr. Strickland, to be clear, the, the parking spaces, so again, we're, we're talking about two carriage houses here. So you've got the living, living space above the garage and those parking spaces below it would be reserved for the folks that would be living in those properties, correct? Correct. Right. And those that and you you mentioned those are one bedroom properties. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant from council members? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one, I know there's some questions on this application regarding short-term rental operation. I want to make sure that Mr. Heinz uh, is connected with my office to make sure we connect you with the folks in licensing to make sure that uh, things are uh, correct there. If there's any issues with short-term rentals operating in that area, that is sort of outside of the zoning purview. Um, but at this time, given the support from city staff uh, with, with regard to um, the variants that have been requested are consistent with what has occurred in this area. Again, adding additional housing density with, within this area um, is part of the housing policy of the city generally and the support of the University Area Commission. I think it's proper for us to move forward at this point. Um, want to uh, see if there's any questions or comments from council members? Seeing none, I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Accept it. Next, I move to uh, adopt the uh, staff findings of the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you. I next move to amend this to emergency. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Amend it. And finally, move for passage as amended. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. And finally, we have Ordinance 0570-2024 to grant variance provisions of Section 3353.03 permitted uses, 3370.05 permitted uses, and 3370.07 conditions and limitations of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 2690 West Dublin Granville Road to allow ground floor residential use in the LC2 Limited Commercial District. Site consists of one parcel developed with an architectural office, firmly a single unit dwelling. The applicant proposes to reestablish a single unit dwelling with the existing office building. A council variance is requested or is required because the current district does not permit ground floor residential uses. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Click, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Hart. Accept it. Thank you. I next move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, move for passage as amended. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, Council President. That's all we have in tonight's zoning agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no further business coming for council, is there a motion to adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Hart. The meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone.